This is from the Alfie course, the coast, Italy. Oh, wow. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I think the volume is much better this week. Huh? This volume. That's, that's, What's that, that's Nancy? 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 Yeah. Uh, hey. uh, you have any problem? No, I'm just checking. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Uh, welcome audio. to join us. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think we're okay. Right? Okay. Let's pass. We're all right. I'm sorry. All right. Um, let us pray. Good and gracious Lord, we heard today that you are asking of us to give up all that we are for you so that we can serve people better, so that we can show our love for you and our faith in you better. Come into our hearts, come into our thoughts, our minds, to allow us to follow you in the way that you wish and the way that is best. We also ask you, Lord, to be with us this week as each of us deals with our own little and big challenges that we know we are walking with you, that we are not alone. We continue to pray for Paul Coyle and for Dee and Stephanie as they walk this journey of discovery and, and comfort in Paul's body and in his mind. We ask that you lead us and that we listen to you. Help us to be your servant, Lord. Help us to be that, please. In thy name we pray, amen. That's great to be back again. And it's like old home week, Diane's here. And Elizabeth is the daughter of my dear friend, Bob Woodman. Bob Woodman was the first person I met at the seminary when I came here. He picked me up at the airport and wound me up Lincoln Drive. Oh, wow. and by the time I got to the top of the, the Lincoln Drive, I, I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely true. He was just the most delightful, generous colleague in the world. He just was wonderful. We didn't, we didn't necessarily agree on all our interpretations of everything, but we had wonderful conversations. We used to go to Two Weeks, which is a bar on, on uh, Germantown oh, Avenue, yeah. and read Hebrew together uh, once a week. <laughs> and we would walk in, and Bob was so well known there that the bartender, I don't remember his name, he would go, Two Bob Burbers. <laughs> Two hamburgers. We just took the order and brought them. They didn't ask us what we wanted. It was just really wonderful. And uh, so it's great. Yeah. So that connection, to have that connection we knew is just wonderful. Let me uh, pick up where we were last week. And, and I don't know how far we'll go. I'd, I'd like to get into the second creation story if we could. Uh, I think what we were, what we, where we came to last week is that. We really learn by um, experience. It's it's not just thoughts that, that teach us. It's not like ideas and concepts that teach us. More profoundly, you learn usually by experience. We remember what we've experienced and what we felt, and it gets a, it gets deeper into us. It, it's not that our thoughts aren't important and that they aren't a part of our understanding, but certainly what we learn most deeply is what we learn by experience. And the Bible really seems to understand that. So that the opening chapter of the Bible is really is really rich in experience. I, I was talking last week. I always interpret it as as he as hip Hebrew poetry that it is poetic in its formation, and. There are many signs of that. And if we don't know all the rules of Hebrew poetry, so it's hard to argue, it's sort of a technical argument, but it works like poetry. I think it really works. It's very evocative language. And we were saying last week, you could kind of feel yourself as, as, as we confront the formlessness and void and the darkness, you feel that kind of disorientation and maybe fear, and then God hovering on the water that quiets us and says, there is, there is this darkness and void, but God is above the waters and not perturbed by them. And then you get, when you get to the first day, it's just wonderful, that very short phrase, like, you know, let there be light and there was light, which is even a 
as I said last week, it's even shorter in Hebrew. <laughs> it's just as short as you can possibly get. There's no phrase that can be shorter. So you, you, we're meant to experience that. And I always, for me, that focuses on the formula that comes at the end of the day. And it says that it was evening and it was morning one day, which is like breathing with us. You know, like breathe, breathe with creation. It was evening and it was morning one day. And it's like a, it's like a, a, a wave cresting and breaking up on the shore, like our breath. And it it really is to ask us to experience experience creation, not think about it, not perceive it from a distance, but to be drawn into it, even though we're not present yet. The whole you know the whole first five days we're nowhere to be seen. Nonetheless, it is written in such a way that we are there and are asked to experience it. And what we experience is really critical because it it is a creation that is immensely orderly. It's immensely confident. It is not uh, a conflict model of creation. There is no conflict here. The closest you get is that in darkness and night, which. But that's never personified, understood as an opposing force. God, that's just the reality that exists out there. And it's important to know that it exists out there. But it's not something that has any ability to compete with God or there's no battle here. And so the world that we are asked to experience is this very confident um, and, and, and good world. And I always think how important that is to talk about having a worldview and that we live within a world. Think about how that influences our attitude towards the world. Even though we know there are lots of tornadoes and storms and all these kinds of things that happen, nonetheless, our basic attitude towards the world is very confident that it is good and that it is ordered by God in ways that God understands and knows. So that's that. I think that's where we got to last week. And it goes on. I'm like, I think we'll skip some of the days if it's okay. We don't have to look at all of them. But there are some things to note. It, the order just keeps coming and coming. And the the kind of the hidden ordering principle that I think is really cool, the way that it's written. The first three days of creation are kind of like general. The first day is the light. The second day you separate the water up in the sky, which the, there's water in the sky this morning. There's the water up in the sky from the water under it. And then on the third day, you get the land separated from, separated out. And then this is the neat thing. The fourth, fifth, and sixth mimic that. They follow it. So the fourth day, first day was light. The fourth day, which is the second time around, you get sun, moon, and stars. Oh, I never know. And the next day, when the waters are separated from the, from the, uh, uh, from the land, you get fish <laughs> and birds. Yeah. yeah. And then the sixth day, when the land was separated from the water and emerges, you get everything that's on the land, all the land animals. Mm -hmm. and, and so you start to get the feeling of God, not just not quite exactly like an engineer, but sort of, you know, so that very orderly. First, you create the conditions, general conditions, and then you fill them in. <laughs> It's, and it's really, I, so there's lots of that stuff going on. Everything, and, and, and I think as we're experiencing it, everything sort of makes sense that it had to happen in that order. The only thing that's kind of out of order is lots of people get s stuck on the light. Now, how can we have light before we had sun, moon, and stars? And where did the light come from? But if you think about it, if they had created the sun, moon, and stars in the you know, God said, and let there be sun, moon, and stars, and, and all the rest of the stuff that it says, it wouldn't work. Yeah. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. It's too much detail. What you want to know is there's light, there's darkness. The fundamental reality was created rather than. So that's the only thing that really is out of sequence. Everything else just sort of can't have. You can't have animals until you have plants. So the plants, because they have to eat the plants, plants get created first. And the simplest, there seems to be sort of a hierarchy of creation. So the simplest plants, plants come first, simplest animals come next, and the most complex animals come. So that it, it's it's well built. You get a sense of the world is kind of being well built. And that's that's important for us too. That the world, it's not nonsensical. It's not chaotic or random. Random, I guess, would be the alternative. 
if there were an alternative to what we have in the creation story, that an alternative would probably be random actions. Just uh, it's got going. Oh, let me think. Oh, well, how about you make a fish, and then six days later you make a bird or something. Like that. It's not like that at all. But well, this is scientifically, I mean, when man evolved, as we believe, the means to sustain him was prison. Yeah. So what I'm saying is scientifically, yeah. I mean, the order is. Yeah. Not about dying. Yeah. You know, so it, to me, it's, it's just remarkable. Yeah. It's not mimicking science. It's not trying to mimic science. No. It's not. It's trying to mimic order. And and the world, you know, with, when you describe it scientifically, it's ordered or it wouldn't work. I mean, yeah. it's science basically scientifically, yeah. it wouldn't work unless unless it was orderly. And in in the in the kind of faith presentation of it, it also has to be ordered, but it's oriented in a different way because that's oriented towards sort of objectively this yeah, is, this yeah. falls no, in this and you can trace it out. There are some parallels. And the creation story is oriented towards wow. us. It's oriented towards making us feel that we live in an orderly world, that the world is orderly around us. And yeah, giving this. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Going back to yeah, go the, it, it being poetry, even poetry, I mean, I'm thinking too, how this story then could more easily be passed on from one generation to the next. And as well as the orderliness of that, you know, the engineering of this, about with people's mind when they're thinking about passing it on to the next generation. You know, kids, you need to learn about this. This is how, you know, we believe. And I think that's such a neat thing to think about. Yeah, yeah. Know? Absolutely, You're isn't it? I mean, it is. It's it's a more it's both a mo more evocative form than just sort of um, just sort of prose, and, and it's also easier to remember. Yeah. Yeah. So when the people <laughs> who were in Babylonian exile were finally getting around to putting it down, <laughs> you know, back <laughs> five hundred some BC, you know, it, they have this form to write it down. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, the thing we have to do today is get ourselves into the picture. And uh, so it, if someone will read, we started 26, and we might as well read. So the, there's a lot of stuff packed in here, a lot of stuff to talk about. So we can read to the end of the, in, to the, end of the chapter. Uh, so we do that, that'll get us all, all. I'll do it. Thank you. Uh, 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, and everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. Yeah. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. See, there's that, that wonderful formula to get summarized and pulled together peace <sighs> so let's, <laughs> let's uh, now i think the, the, the first thing is not at all obvious but it, i want to ask it on it, it, it is obvious it's not a hidden thing but uh, we don't pay much attention to it on what day are human beings created six. Six. On, the six. Yeah, six days. on the sixth day and what else is created on the sixth day the land animals yeah now you know, that's just that's just a sort of fact here, but it's really significant, isn't it? 
Suppose, and this is sort of like a thought experiment, suppose we get our own day. But, you know, it, and we're created not on the sixth day, but God you know, puts the sixth day to bed and then says on the seventh day, let us make humankind. What would it say? Where would we be located? And all, this is all about getting us right, placed correctly in the world, understanding where we fit in correctly. <laughs> um, what would be the implication of a seventh day creation for human beings? And then we'd have an eight day week. <laughs> no work day. That's that would be the problem. But uh, what would what would be the significance? And which is to say, what's the significance of it being on the sixth day? <clears throat> well, on the sixth day, we are sharing the world with other creation that God has called. You know, that God has created on that day. It's not just us, but animals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a message in that, I think, that there's an interconnection between us and our world. Exactly. Isn't it? Yeah, so exactly. that we may be at the end of the chain, but it is a chain that we are a part of and need to hold fast to. Right. <laughs> it's right. It is a chain. It's an ascending chain. So that what get, what gets created last is going to be the highest in the pinnacle in the pyramid. That's the way it's put together. But then the question becomes, what's the relationship between the pinnacle and everything else? And I you just summarized it. Well. Interdependence. Interdependence, and you're an animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like from the very beginning, we should know our place. <laughs> yeah. Don't think, see, if you, if you put them on a seventh day, you've got a real question about what the status of human beings are. Are they a separate, completely separate class of existence? Which would make us think sort of semi-God-like, you know, higher than everything else. And, and that, would, that would skew our relationship with the world, wouldn't it? It would really skew our relationship if we thought we were God, or God-like, or so. But yet, this brings us down to the level of the animals, but does it give us a certain dignity? No, we have dominion. Yeah, we're gonna, mm -hmm, we're gonna get it, but we're, we are the top of the, you know, or we say the top of the food chain, <laughs> yeah, the top of the pyramid. So we have, in a very, it's just a lovely, very careful placement. Uh, you are, you're, you're where God was going with this, but, don't let that go to your head, <laughs> in a sense. You know, realize, feel yourself as a part of, done, you said so well, feel yourself as a part of the creation. Then we get to the exciting part where people are actually created and there's, there's lots going on here. How does the act of creation um, begin? This is really interesting. It's new, it's, it's unique. When it gets to our creation, there's a unique moment. Well, it begins with God's word. He speaks and it happens. That's right. But when it comes to people, it takes some action. Not, not in this part, but in the later part about the actual creation of man taking the bone from man. Yeah, in that second story. There, that... Was, there was more hands-on, whereas previously, just he said it, it happened. Yeah. Let's not go there because that, you know, in a way, yeah. that's a, that's a separate story, yeah. and right. and they don't, they they don't. It's not a continuous story. They're two different stories. So we have to look at, at this one. But 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 right. I mean, I like the fact that you know he took the dirt, the dust. Now you're ahead of the story. Got to hold on here. Aren't you, aren't you asking about? Man? No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. no. See. No. Here's the, here's the issue. I mean, just in, in yeah. his image is the yeah, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have we have basically two yeah. stories of how people got created, and they're not compatible with one another. No. They don't. It's not, not like people have tried relentlessly to make one story out of two, and they they don't fit together. It's is there just, any timing on uh, 
when one was written and the yeah, other. Yeah, no, yes. I mean, the, the, the scholarly, yeah, yeah. Here's, where you, here's where we run into trouble. Scholarly consensus is that the story that is in chapter two, with God kneeling down and forming out of the, the soil, is earlier than the story Emily already alluded that that's probably you know some maybe sometime even in the exile, fairly late. So there, that's the chronological order, but the order in the Bible reverses that. And so, I always resist the, the kind of the chronological reading because that's not the witness of the Bible. But what the Bible said is you got to get this. You got to put us in the big picture first. And, and so tell you how the world got formed and I'm going to plunk you right in the middle of it. And, and that's what you need to know first. And then in the second story, we're going to focus in in a completely different way and focus on the creation of, of, of human beings. And I think they have very different, you know, they have yeah. very different intents. The one is yeah. to place us in the physical world. The second is much more social relationships. So the second one, people actually talk to God and God talks to them. There is and there's conversation and there's social interaction. There's nothing of that in the first one yeah. at all. So they're doing different things. So I always keep them separate and keep them in the order they are, rather than scholarly kind of. And nobody who, disputes who, that the. Who days that order? What? Well, yeah. <laughs> but if you're, if you're saying we that this is the way it, it, it's meant to be. Yep. We don't know. The problem is we don't know the whole editorial process in detail. So, so are you basing meant to be on order? I'm, yeah, here's what I'm saying. Scholars are, there's hardly anybody that disagrees with this. I mean, it's just only sort of people who still think Moses wrote the whole thing. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't disagree with it. I'm just asking. How yeah, no, have. but so they think that it, it's that Moses wrote it in this order. But everybody scholarly and Bob Bloom. <laughs> Certainly, everybody scholarly uh, knows that the the first story was written afterwards, and then the, the tough part comes becomes um, who did the editing, and we don't have that process described. There's lots and lots of studies, and they don't agree with one another. We just know how it came out, and I always want to say that they knew what they were doing when they were editing. Whoever was editing it. Um, uh, was editing it to tell the story correctly, mm -hmm. that it was meant, uh, then I studied with and worked on my dissertation, but would always say that they, they know that they are forming it for later generations, not just for their own generation. So we can focus on origins, who wrote it and what was the intent when it was written, but ultimately when it becomes scripture, they're not thinking about the immediate moment, they are really trying to form a literature that's, you know, that can speak to subsequent generations. They really are thinking about forming a scripture. So, what's, yeah, and what it does. And so, take, when we take seriously its own order, then we are inclined to ask, well, why did they do it like this? Well, what's the, what's the effect of putting the Bible together like this? Of putting the broad creation story mm -hmm first and the more focused one together second. Well, if you want to think about that hard, reverse it. I always say the best way to interpret the Bible is to change it, to substitute something else. So take the liberty of putting the second story, creation in the dust with human beings created out of the dust, the woman created out of the man and then the fall, because that falls right into it and put that before the creation of the world. And you'll see why they did it. Yeah. Instantly. Yeah. Hmm? Mm. Well, it wouldn't work the other way around. Yeah, if they organized it chronologically, it would make no sense to anybody. Not at all. So they did it. They did it right. And I think what we do then is follow, follow the intent of the scripture itself. I mean, how it comes together. Oh, wait. Let's get this back in it. Let's get the, the, to the, to the question the of the image. image. The image part. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and what we've been talking about how that locate, how everything in the story locates us and places us and gives us something. And I think the issue here, what's it give us? That's, it's so powerful. What does it, 
what does it convey to us? How does it make us feel in this world? What's our place? What is our place in the Very world? Special. Very special. Very special. Very special. Anything else about yeah. the image of God? When you say the image of, I think of a child and a parent, a historical and physicality, uh, that biologically born children are physically in the image of parents. And, most and of the time. Most of the time. Okay, yeah, but what I guess what I'm saying is, I, I think that forges a connection. Good. Oh, good. You know? Yep, it's a connection. Yep. And in fact, how strong is the connection to be in the image of someone? I think it's, it's pretty strong because it, it, it gives you, whether you want to change it later, it gives you a first definition of who you are. Good, good, good. good. Please. Where does the soul come in? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> the closest we're, we're gonna, we can have that discussion when we get to the second story. And it's usually focused on God blowing something into the nose of human beings. Yeah. And the question becomes, what is that something? Oh, wow. Sure. Yeah. And, and that is normally, in later tradition, that is the grounding of the idea of the, the kind of the two-part person. We have a physical part, that's the dust, and then we have a spiritual world, and that's the wind that was blown into it. I'm... I'm not sure. I mean, I know that that's what later tradition, certainly that's what our tradition really builds on, but I don't know that that's in that passage. Looks like to me that it's just air. <laughs> it may just be air. <laughs> so, but that's the, that's the point of, that's the point of, of trying to think about that. The, re the relationship between God and his creation. Yeah, it, it's defined differently there. I mean, in that second story, we're ahead of the game again. But it is. Here, what's the relationship between it? Is it as intimate as that? No. No. Is it powerful, though? I mean, when we talk about image, is it a powerful image of the relatedness to God? Yeah. yeah. It is. It is. I mean, you don't know what the image means here. Exactly. It, you know, what, what is it to be in the image of God? It doesn't define, it uses two different terms, but it doesn't define either one of them. The image and likeness. And, you know, these are undefined terms here. And all they do is connect us. I mean, I think they're connecting terms. They, they, they're both terms that say you're like God. You're in some way like God, but it doesn't say how. Is it, is it you look like God? Is it that you have some attributes of God, <clears throat> completely undefined. It doesn't tell us what it is. And so the, when it doesn't tell us, the question is, without that information, it's still telling us a lot, isn't it? Yeah. I think as human beings, we want to read into it all sorts of different things, and I'm not sure that we should. I, mean, I think we have to be open. I mean, maybe, maybe open to the idea that we are created to be loving like God, you know, and maybe that's a wonderful attribute that we have, but, but there's, it's not defined in any way. No. We have characteristics, but, but we aren't God. And see, that's really, see, that's what's really critical. Is an image and a likeness identical with the thing that is an image and likeness of? No. no, no. I mean, if I take a picture of you, it'll look like you, but it's not you. And that's what the same thing. It's not saying you're God. It's being real careful here. It uses, if it, if it, you know, I always say, you know, change the story. God took a, a, a nail clipping <laughs> and formed it into human beings. Then we're divine. You know, we're made out of divine substance, and that makes us divine. But that's not what's going on here. We're not divine. It's, there's a, it's happening both ways. Like God, but not God. So get that straight. <laughs> isn't that, I mean, is that it? Don't think you're God, but do you think you're really important? I mean, <laughs> yeah. relationship. Yeah, and it does stress the relationship because to be in the image is to be like, and you know, the only it, these are undefined terms, and I think 
And I think within the, within the poem, within the story, the, way, the only thing we can do to kind of define them is to say, well, what do we know about God so far? I mean, what do we know about God if we, that we could share that likeness? Well, what do we know about God? What's God like in the, in the story leading up to this? What do we know? Creator. What, yeah. Yeah. We know he's powerful. Powerful, creative, very creative. Orderly. Organized. <laughs> organized. Benign. Benign, yes, yeah. 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 Even more than benign, benevolent. benevolent. Yeah. Making things good. I mean, that's benevolence. Benign. Yeah, so yeah, we know. So if we're going to be in the image of God, those would presumably be things, are they things that we could share in some, in, maybe not in the perfection of God, okay, but are these things that we could, can we be creating? Can we? seek to maintain order in the world. Yes, we can. Can we do good in the world? Make things good in the world? Well, yes, we can. Is there anything? So when I think about image, I, I think it's not defined in terms of abstract characteristics or something. It, here it has to be defined in what do we know about God so far? What's God like? And what would that mean we're like when we're created? I, I think we as humans uh, put on, you know, create these characteristics of God, which we, you know, because it is a way that we can better understand. And I'm not saying it's good or it's smart, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's like, you know, I mean, if if you have, what is your image of God? Well, you you just talked about things, but we as humans. I want to put something personal on it of course you know and so as a result i mean you know we, we can't worship can we something that we cannot visually see no and and here it's important because we we, we said you used the wonderful word relationship i yeah. mean it, it is establishing a kind of a relationship in a very formal way it's doing it but it is a relationship, and that relationship has to have some character or it's nothing. And so it, it, there is a danger of us projecting what we'd like to be onto God yeah, here. Exactly. Instead of going the other direction. Exactly. And that's why I said the only way you can really control that is to say mm -hmm. you have to uh, you have to control your understanding of what it means to be in the image by what you know about God. From this and that's going to get filled out you know massively later on the whole story from now on is going to be revealing more of what god's like but you got enough now to have a pretty good image of what it would be like to be in the image of god it's almost like we were to think that god is made in our image that's the danger <laughs> that is in fact the danger and it is it's not a theoretical danger when it's particularly when we get to the idea of control of the world that's in fact what happens. That's precisely what happens. But it, the, the first move is to really elevate us, I think. To be in the image of God is to elevate us and also to imbue us with a character. So if, this is, if God is like this and you're the image of God, what are you like? You're creating, you have the power, to do things and, and have them, you know, actually happen, mm -hmm. and you have the you have the ability to do good, just like mm -hmm. God does. Mm -hmm. Day one, He gave us all those gifts. It, it, all, you're all given it, and a huge kind of dignity, just the dignity of being able to say. And I always think that we reject this; that we don't. Nobody really takes this seriously. Nobody says to themselves very often, "I am in the image of God." I am the image of God. Because if we did, it would really change things, wouldn't it? It would change how we interact with one another. I always think, you know, if, if we took that seriously, most of the bad things that happen in the world couldn't possibly happen. I mean, if you really thought, I'm the image of God, and this, this evil act that I'm about to do is the image of God, if we were serious about it, it, would, it, it cuts against that. I think it goes beyond an evil act that we do to the extent of evil that we tolerate 
because the, the, the trait that jumps out at me when you're talking about the image of God, and what, what do we know so far, is that uh, yes, he's powerful, yes, he's creative, but he's concerned, he's empathetic, yes, he's taking care of what he's creating, um, and it's not about He's all powerful, but it's not all about power. It's not about no, no. command being in control. No, it's it's being caring. That is what jumps out at me in terms of the image of God, not just in our actions, but in our omissions. No, this what is, we tolerate. This is, this is really good. I mean, God's got tremendous power and beats the whole world off for Pete's sake. How much power does that take? It takes lots of power. But you don't have the sense of God as some sort of. You know, like that. It's, it's a much, much, you know, much, much more limited. Mm-hmm. Even though God has all the power and is doing everything here, God is is not this this um, big egomaniac. Yeah. The motivation is his his care. Yeah. Yeah. And Thank concern. you. That's, I think that's nice to see. Mm-hmm. To feel as we see it, because it, 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 we've been talking about being uh, oriented in the world, but at the same time, we're sort of getting oriented to God. Mm-hmm. What's going on here is we're getting not only oriented to the world that God creates, but, but oriented to God. And so if you think about being in the image of God, being told you are in the image of God, take that seriously, then what would our response to God be? I mean, how would we, what would that, what kind of a response would that, would that naturally generate? Well, it might not be too good. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, he just, I mean, we have a lot of bad traits and, and uh, we don't want that. I mean, we, we don't want our supreme being to, I wouldn't want him to have my traits. I mean, you know, <laughs> I hope he's better. than that. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to, and, and we're going to have, you have to some point account for the failures that we have. I mean, our the distance between us and, and God, because this is pulling us toward God. I mean, t- towards identification with God. And I think you're right to raise up. Okay, so we got a problem because if we then take us and project it onto God, you get a kind of a yeah, a lot of devil in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's but to to turn it around. I mean, to, we'll get to that. But to turn it around and to say, just what do we give it now? It it, it is. If we take God as the standard, then we're supposed to you know, be in that standard. That is really something. Yeah. I mean, that's to take yourself seriously and to, and to have, have your, your, your human dignity, what we would call human dignity, elevated about as far as it can go without getting into the dangerous territory of, of I'm a God. Yeah, which comes in later in the story. Yeah. Doesn't it's it? always a danger. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. always this danger of thinking that you are God. And but the Bible you, worries about that. If you look at what he gave us to, to deal with life, our brain, our <laughs> intellect, <laughs> work, I don't mean physically, but mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. you know. Emotions. Yes. That what a leap of faith he, what he has in us. And he gives us very powerful things to have. You know, yes. and I would think his vision was that we will always use them for good. No, here that's clearly the case. There isn't, there isn't anything that disturbs this picture, is there? There isn't God going. Let's make God. Let's make human beings in the image, in my image. But boy, that's going to cause trouble. But, yeah, I guess I guess I can handle that. <laughs> there's no, there's no dark, there's no shadow here, which is it's very optimistic, isn't it? It's just incredibly. And the, awesome. iron, the, the beauty of it is he still does. With yeah. all, with all <laughs> the truth, he still that's, does. That's, she does some later. But you know, this is that's I, what's I've amazing. Had this kind of here. So it, it, it's it's a it's a very powerful moment in terms of properly locating us in the world. And and it also tells us things, it locates us with God, because a God who would make us in the image, is that an insecure God? No, this is a really very confident God. I can make people who are really pretty, you know, I'm taking them very seriously, giving them a lot of responsibility, elevating them to a high, very high level, and I don't feel in the least bit threatened by that. 
and that's not normally a human, not, not necessarily a human. It's very few people who promote people underneath them without fearing that they'll take over their job or displace yeah. them. And God doesn't have any, there's none of that. This is just a very absolutely confident, in control, this is the way it's supposed to work, God. And it gives us, it allows us space then to assume that dignity without having to worry with some sort of a conflict relationship with God. I think of myself as a classroom teacher, when you shut the door, you're king or queen in, in, in that <laughs> domain, and you want to bring out the absolute best in your students. Hopefully. And, yes, yeah. okay, but that's your goal. That is your goal to do that. But at the same time, you don't want them to overtake you. Yeah. So it's a balance. Yeah, and there's no balance like that. It's just God saying, I want you to be just as good as you. I want you to be like me. <laughs> I want you, I tell you, I'm in that, in the image of God, I want you to be my friend. This is dominion. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then in the next verse, he says, not only have I created you, but then he says, be fruitful and multiply. So he has confidence that we're going to carry on. Yes. You know, yeah. and, and, and living that could, in his image. And that's part created. of the plan. Kind of cool. It is. And, that, and that that's planned planned in. It's not, you know, that's part of the plan. I make two people will. That's something we need to comment on too. I mean, I think just in passing at least that male and female are created at the same time. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And and to me, that's an image. Is there any hierarchy among people that God's instituted? Did God create uh, a ruling class first? And a, you know, are there castes? Did God create castes? So you have a priestly caste and then you have a ruling caste, like the Indian system. We have, we have a caste system. Is there a caste system? No, that's a creation of man. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think. This is this is completely non-hierarchical among human beings. Does everybody is everybody male, female, everybody else, every every other kind of distinction? Is everybody in the image of God? Yeah, yeah. Does that mean we're all lucky, that we're all equally have the equal dig dignity? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's unavoidable to that conclusion, but people have long have long avoided it. But it seems to me that that's what it's saying. And I take it that the male and female is is just seen as the most fundamental dichotomy because it's biological, but that all dichotomies are included here. There is no preference given to one group of people over everybody else. That we don't, when we created that, is not just not allowed, but it's actually kind of ruled out. Now, so. It's, that just we wouldn't want to miss that. I think that's really important because it also tells, I mean, in our society, it, it, it tells us how we, it starts to tell us how we relate to one another. And I think it's important, especially important for women who are being told all the time that they're sort of some sort of. Thank you for saying that. Seriously. Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a preference here. There isn't. Mm -hmm. No, there's not. Where do you get that? You don't get that here in the Bible. We're gonna to have to struggle with it when we get to the rest of the next yeah. story. But, yeah. but uh, I think there's good ways to struggle with it there. And then the dominion. That the next thing is the dominion that we need to take a moment to 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 talk about because I think um, that's that's a particularly now it's a real point of discussion, oh. isn't it? Because you, yeah. what, yeah. but here the key thing I think. The, the danger is that, you know, that we now make God into our image and right. we think of dominion. And when we think of dominion, we think of the bigger box. <laughs> you know, you can do anything and it doesn't matter. You know, I think of control of it. And that's it. And then that would be projecting that on God because we're in the image of God. So is right. God the bigger box? Well, no. You know, so that if you turn it around, when we exercise dominion, what's that dominion supposed to look like? Care. Caregiving. Care. Caregiving. To maintain what God created. Yeah, yeah. But we, we said that part of what the image of God is to be creative. So create. Create things. Make, make the world you know, better. Better. Yeah, create. 
So all the creative kind of things that are life enhancing, they are good. But does it give us the, real, the ability to cut down the, the very last tree in the whole world? Absolutely. He cut them down with the tornado. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's God's yeah, discretion, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm, okay, yeah. we've got the discretion. But we don't have the right to. Yeah. And, and I, I think what, what you were saying is exactly right. That then we are turning, we're turning our vision into and projecting it onto God and seeing that as permission to do stuff that God never contemplated being here. Pillaging of the earth, kind of, right. which has been our history. Yeah. Yeah. Just take everything and you don't have to you have to place it. All three monuments. Yeah. And, and what I think the only way you can do that is by separating the uh, instructions here to have dominion from the creation of you as the image of God. If you hold those apart, and say, well, I am in the image of God, uh, and that's separate from, or that, or maybe the only connection is that conveys the power to do anything I want. But if you connect them and really think about it, then you have to exercise dominion in the image of God. Like God would do that. So this always seems to me that it's often cited as the justification kind of. I can go cut that whole forest down and turn it into charcoal. So what's the word what's the word in Hebrew for dominion? Is it that strong that yeah? Very strong. There are two of them. And um, one of them, I, I looked at this up and it, it uh, the, the striking things that I remember about looking at all the instances of it. It uh, it's the radar, it's is the Hebrew, and it means to uh, it, in many cases, to rule over somebody you've conquered. So very strong. I mean, it's very, yeah. it, it's a very strong kind of in those. Well, often we use the word dominion politically more so than creatively. Mm -hmm. You know, we think of um, power, you know, mm -hmm. political power. And I think, I think the, the, the choice of words and the other ones, Bashal, and it's also really strong uh, kind of ruler. It's what rulers do. And, and, uh, I think it wants it to be strong. I mean, it wants it to have a sense that you have a lot of you have a lot of power in this world that God's creating. But it doesn't take away that it, it gives the power, but it says it's always be exercised in God, not yes. in yeah. your desire. With care, with caring, with care, for those with girls. care and creativity, and so that at the end of the day, see, at the end of every day, God—not every day, but almost every day—God says that He was doing it. It's good so that it comes what you bring out is good and not just good for your pocketbook and not just good for your comfort, but good for the world. That's the criteria God's using. God looks down and says it's good. It means it's good for the world. It fits into the order. And when you take, so you have lots of power, but it has to be. It's, that's, the power should come responsibility to for those. Who have given you that power? Yeah, just the nature of the power. See, what's the power like in this story? Where, what's power look like in the creation story? Compassion. Yeah, yeah it's love. It, it, it looks like caring, caring creating, creative. creative. It looks like life sustaining. It looks like it's easy. And it's morning or day. It, it looks like confidence. No one. It looks like all kinds of good stuff. It doesn't beauty. look like raw beauty. Yes. And in fact, the word for good, and God saw that it was good, could be the, is the same word is used for beautiful. Oh. And there's a, you know, and, and it depends on context. But what is that word in Hebrew? Tov. 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 So in other contexts, so translators usually pick, and God saw that it was good, but I always think that part of that is in this co poetic context is and God said it was beautifully good. <laughs> or something like that. And so that the power here it has to be exercised like God's power. And what's God's power like? Well, then, God, you know, it's, it's, it, it is a focused power. It is not a, we think of power as I can do anything to get well, please. 
That's what I thought. Okay. Care for each other. Care for each other. <laughs> Parents care for the whole world. Yes, I feel so powerless when it comes to caring for the world. Yeah. I, yeah. See, that's the thing. God takes care of the big. <laughs> <laughs> Our participation is not to take over responsibility right. for, for what God does. And that's the good thing. You know, so, any little thing you do, mm -hmm. I mean, um, recycle. Good. But they good. say that's such a drop in the bucket. Well, well, right. you know, yeah. we, 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 we can vote. We can vote and we can. Yeah. Recycle, but yeah. that's that. I feel like that's yeah. you can you can take care. Of, you know, don't you, don't let the water run forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems little, but that's what we have power over. That's the that's our little. Opinion. And that's the, <laughs> and, and and that's important. I mean, it doesn't ask us to become God. That you know, it doesn't say, okay, I, <laughs> this is not a story where God forms the earth, puts us in it in God's image, and walks away. Huh. You know, it says, okay. I got here. You got everything you need to know. This is the way you ought to do it, and I'll see you later. <laughs> so God takes responsibility for the creation from getting it right at the beginning, which is important. But then also doesn't just sort of walk away from creation. I think it is. So it's going to, I'm going to sound dramatic, but I think it is an evil force that exists uh, and can be used to convince us that we cannot do things, and that the things that we do. Uh, our significance. For years in my family, the little ones would take trash walks. Three years old, they have a bag and they're picking mm -hmm. up. Has it changed the world? No. But no, it, it has. But it has it has changed that three year old. You know, it's so changed. yes. It's so I, I think sometimes the powers that be who are making tons of money off of this desecration somehow yeah. are able to convince us that we don't have power. See, these things do change the world. I mean, I take my dog for a walk. I take a bag along too, and I pick up along the Linda just, yeah. the road. But without and, even having a dog, she does this. And <laughs> when I walk out, and all the stuff is laying alongside the road, I think badly of my neighbors. Yeah, mm -hmm. I yeah. think what kind of jerk throws you know a whole potato chip bag out along a beautiful stream. Mm -hmm. And by the time I pick it up and walk back, I don't think that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just all pristine and it looks mm -hmm. good, and it's and. Does it change the world? It does, my God. And anybody who else comes back, I hope, comes past. I, the people who throw it out, I don't quite understand. Do you like that? I mean, do you like it like that? Is you think it's a, are you decorating? You are you decorating here? Creating a clean car. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. Is this, do you see this as decoration? I don't. So, but by the time, so it does, these little things do change the world and they, they, they can be they can be a way of affirming our image of God. I mean, which we, I think we, I think a lot of part, part, part of human misconception of themselves is from not affirming that, that I am the image of God. It's really hard to do. It's, it's, you know, we know our flaws and we go, oh, you know, come on. Me, the image of God, gets serious here. And I think we all do that, but at some point in order to get the, the, benefits of the creation, you have to say, you know, bottom, I'm still the image of God. That cannot be taken away. Why can't it be taken away? Because I it was, still have some good parts. Right. And it was, <laughs> and it was, you do, Victoria. Yeah. And it was built in. in we talk about hardwiring. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the hardwiring. That's the way you're created is your hardwiring. And you're created in the image of God. And that's just cannot lose that. You can distort it and you can override it with your own selfishness and all kinds of things. I mean, the whole rest of the story is going to be a lot of that. But at base, we need to come back to that sense that God got it right, God knew what God was doing in creation and put us in the right place in it. That that's what's going on here. That we are located properly. You know, and that we can claim it. But we need to claim even in small things, I, I, think, I think we've all had the same sense that this is not going to, you know, yeah. throw this water bottle away or don't use a water bottle. And, and it just feels like the what's that? What's that? Yeah, so what's large. that do? Well, it, it affirms that trying to fit into the creativity of God 
you know, to at least defer on that. Well, good, you get a sense, don't you? I mean, it's a, a story really wants us to see ourselves as serious and deeply, deeply grounded in creation. Properly grounded, <clears throat> locates us. The last of the story, well, we could stop. I know we do. And, uh, but the, what, what's great about the seventh day, nothing happens. <laughs> and so it's a day of complete inaction, but it's not empty. And, and what the seventh day does is take us right back to God. It's like we started last week, we, we talked about in the beginning, God. So what's the first thing that comes up in the picture? It's God. And on the seventh day, after all the creativity is done, what's, where are we? Well, we're still sort of surrounded by God. And that's what, it, I think that's the real heart of the testimony everything 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 that i hear is god and on the, on the seventh day it is a day of reflection on that that it's god who is god is not reduced to the creative act god exists you know, sort of surrounding the creative it's beyond the creative act. It's in the creative act. <laughs> that's beyond. so comforting and it, 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 it's <laughs> the most important thing you can know about the world it's in the embrace of God. It, that's what makes it work. That's what makes it work to the extent that it does work. But sometimes we wonder. Thanks. As always, my friend, you have given us new insights to that which has existed for some time. And you have given us things to take home with us to ponder. Let me ask you about next week. <laughs> um, I was hoping we would get to the second story, but they both you brought it up and we, we're drawn to it. We're trying to bring it in. And, and uh, so I, I think we should go ahead and do that. And then the, the, what was going to be the third session is to look at some of the Psalms. And uh, there are a couple Psalms, not a lot, that are creation Psalms. Psalm 8, if anybody knows Psalm 8 and Psalm 130, 148, uh, that are creation Psalms where they, they, they orient us towards creation in a different way because they're praise songs. And so they say that when you understand creation, when you look at creation and you understand it, what, you're, what you, you get comfort out of it and you get orientation in the world, but what you ultimately get is praise for God. And that's the ultimate orientation. And we can, we can maybe, if, if we talk about the second creation story, uh, chapter two, um, uh, we won't have a lot of time to talk about it, but we can maybe at least read it and, uh, and, and just feel the kind of wonder. Psalm 8 is just marvelous. It's just wonders, you know, of boy. When I look at creation, I think of myself. I feel so small and insignificant, but you don't get that thought. So it's a great, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful you song. You know, there is a line in Parents of Fire when Eric Little says, God has made me fast and I run to his glory. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if you have good organizational skills, God has made you that and you honor him by doing it. I mean, all these individual little things that we do in our lives to live can be that honor to God who created us. Indeed. You know, something as simple as just just, uh, I don't know, uh, doing your laundry, doing the wash, washing dishes. They seem so mundane, but they're essential. Yes, and, and really what the Bible wants to create in us is that sense of praise, of our life being an act of praise, yeah. that that is the proper orientation. It's not, and, and, and what's so wonderful about Psalm 8 is it, it's amazed by that, but it, it doesn't, denigrate people, it, it exalts them in the act of praising God, that your real exaltation is going to come not from thinking your hot stuff, but from, <laughs> but from praising God for what you see around you and your part in it, how, how important your part is. And that's a different way of thinking about our location in the world. It, we don't make the world for ourselves and then take credit and glory in our achievement in it. We prosper for the way that, that God has made the world, and then we praise God for doing it that way. We can communicate with God. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, 
And we'll see that next week in the second story. I won't be here. I'm going to see my granddaughter play softball. <laughs> where's, where's that? Where are you going? Outside of Baltimore. Oh, cool. You're going to get to go into Baltimore? Or no? Yeah. Uh, I, I just asked, I went to Baltimore last Monday with my son. He had a grand day just walking around. Where did you go, Gal? Where, what Bell's Point first, then the Inner Harbor, and then up to um, 